What I'd like to talk about today is in the table of contents. Can you slide that up, Kelly? Um, I'm going to just kind of talk about the SUGA administration and how we got where we are now. I'm going to talk about the election for uh, the prime minister, who the candidates are, what that process is. The process is, is somewhat uh, convoluted. It's uh, um, uh, involving not only the members of the uh, diet who belong to the LDP, but also uh, rank and file members of the LDP. And then I'd like to touch upon potentially who is going to win in this uh, election. There you go, Kelly. <clears throat> um, so uh, with that, uh, the cabinet formation and then the election of the lower house after that. Um, next slide, please. So uh, you might be asking, I think most of the people here on this call already know me, they know my company, they know that Langley Esquire is a public affairs consulting firm uh, that I've been in Japan for more than 40 years. Um, I went to Japanese law school, I went to US law school, and I worked inside uh, many um, multinational companies as their director of government affairs and as their general counsel. Um, but more um, relevant to this conversation, when I finished Japanese law school, I was hired by a member of the parliament in the upper house. His name is Nakayama Taro. Um, this is the first time for a foreigner to work inside the diet in the capacity as a diet secretary. So it was big news. My last name didn't help. Um, but I, I really cut my teeth. I was mentored. I was trained a lot on how Japanese politics works. I was involved in many campaigns and I traveled all over the country. Um, and because I guess I was just uniquely situated, even compared to other Japanese of my same stature, I just had better exposure. I saw and experienced and learned a lot of things because um, the people that were surrounding me wanted me to have that, that experience and that exposure. My member, uh, Nakayama Tada, was a member of the Hosoda faction, the largest faction it was at that time, the Fukuda faction. And so um, I, I follow Mr. Abe uh, very closely, and I have a lot of friends, not just in, in that faction, but within the LDP. And I've maintained that over, you know, 35 years of, of doing this business. So that's why I'm able to talk somewhat um, um, insightfully about this somewhat esoteric subject. But more importantly, uh, throughout my career, since I've been in, in corporate business as well, doing um, you know government affairs for uh, major foreign capital companies. I've also joined these benkyokai, these study groups that are hosted by uh, members, prominent members of the diet. So um, you know I belong to maybe twenty of those. So I'm I'm constantly getting update up updates and and fed information on what's going on behind the scenes, what's coming up. So um, with that as background, I'm I'm able to speak you know with some degree of fluidity, fluidity about, you know, Japanese politics. And um, I really appreciate those that follow me or that follow me on Clubhouse. So with the next slide, I'd like to talk about how we got where we are right now. So Mr. Suga is the current prime minister. He succeeded Mr. Abe a little bit more than a year ago. Also in September, we're still in September. He succeeded Mr. Abe in September of last year. Um, and uh, there were a couple of major things that happened over that year that guide us to this point now. And this graph talks about some of them. Some of them are weighty issues that determined why we're here. Some of them are just uh, points of reference. For example, the Olympics. The Olympics um, didn't really impact that much on the prime minister's standing, but the Tokyo um, gubernatorial, I'm sorry, the Tokyo uh, metropolitan elections did, uh, the elections for um, for Yokohama, where he had somebody that was in his cabinet who resigned from his cabinet to run as the mayor for uh, Yokohama, he lost. And there were a couple of by-elections that happened too, not all of them are listed here, Hiroshima um, and a couple of other by-elections. The LDP just didn't do very well. And as we got towards, um, you know, August and September, uh, things were not looking good for the prime minister. You might remember that he was negotiating hard with uh, Nikai uh, for uh, the secretary general of the LDP on maybe maneuvering the closing of the house before the election of prime minister or changing it this way so that one way or the other, he stands in the poll position to benefit the most. Either he's going to have the election for the prime minister first or the election of the lower house first, so that if the lower house does really well, then he will therefore succeed himself. He can tell people, you know, that's 
The reason why we won all of the seats that we did was because I'm your prime minister. It makes a certain amount of sense. Unfortunately, the vectors were not in his favor. Next slide, please. So um, the election for um, the prime minister in, in Mr. Suga's case really depends uh, largely on you know, public perceptions and that sort of thing. He was considering the, the um, voting for the lower house, closing down the lower house, which he has the, uh, the ability to do. Um, it didn't seem to go very well. He was suffering from low approval ratings. Publicly, it says around 34%. Uh, most people would say it's, it was in the high 20s. There was growing discontent, discontent within the party over his decisions, over decisions by Nikai. Even before this, um, many people were chafing at his somewhat dictatorial style. He's the only prime minister in post-war history that doesn't have or didn't have a faction backing him. So he was somewhat um, uh, beholding to the powers that got him into that, that position. But as this date for the prime minister's election term, uh, the term for the uh, party president came close, he began to be a little bit more um, exploratory. Um, this really caused concern among particularly the younger members of the of the parliament because uh, you know although they might have won maybe two elections or three elections they comprise almost 46 percent of the entire um, uh, diet within the ldp so the younger members are concerned they're worried if if the prime minister is not strong and aggressive uh, their chance of winning is far lower and so um, they were afraid that if they stuck with Mr. Suga, then the non-affiliated members, so they're members of the LDP, and then there are members who are not affiliated with the LDP, or maybe affiliated with the LDP, but they don't belong to a faction. So um, there's a, a large swing block there. Um, Mr. Suga was worried about that. And in, in fact, some press reports uh, say that um, he wasn't able to even generate, uh, had it come to that, the 20 um, endorsements to to be to run for a prime minister. So uh, just after a year in office, he uh, announced that he would resign and not contest the LDP uh, leadership race and focus completely on COVID, the COVID response. Since that time, and it's just been a couple of weeks ago, since that time, the perception and appreciation of the LDP has gone up and the perception and uh, appreciation of the government ruling, um, you know, the, the COVID response and, and politics has also come up. So obviously it was a good move for the prime minister to do that. Next slide, please. So um, I think we've already talked pretty much about this, trying to rally support for the SNAP election. Uh, he, I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong, wrong slide. So um, the LDP will um, have a election for their party president because the current term for Mr. Suga ends. It ends on a week from uh, tomorrow, actually, um, and they will have a, an in-house vote for the LDP president. That is divided between sitting members of the parliament. There are uh, 382 of them. And there is a similar number for the uh, rank and file members of the LDP, 382. Um, they will take a vote on uh, Wednesday of next week. Um, they will select a candidate. There are four candidates. And uh, the rule is um, if there's two candidates and one has more than 51%, he will become the party leader. If there are three candidates or four candidates, it becomes a little bit more difficult and you need to have more than 50% to become elected as the party leader. So this explains a little bit why uh, even Kishida announced he wanted to become prime minister, then Mr. Kono, and then you had uh, Takeichi, who also came in and was somewhat, somewhat, somewhat of a spoiler. Then Noda came in, you've got four of them. So there's a two-phase two uh, runoff that will be held uh, next Wednesday. The first part is um, the division of members of the parliament and uh, LDP members rank and file an equal number of votes. If one of the candidates doesn't get 51%, then it runs into the runoff, but only two of those will go. 
uh, most likely at this point in time, it looks like that would be uh, a runoff between Kishida and uh, Kono, but it's unclear right now. Um, Ms. Takeishi is um, really starting to come up in the polls and, and doing um, a good job in her uh, pronouncements, her public speaking on TV and that sort of thing. Um, I think that's good for that particular slide. Can we move on to the next slide? You know, typically um, the LDP president is selected along uh, factional lines. So the LDP is like a big tent. It has, you know, several factions in it. The factions are listed here. There's there's uh, seven factions, and then there's a, a group of independents who don't belong to any one faction. The largest faction is the uh, Sewa, Sewa Seisaku Kenkyu Kai. Uh, colloquial, the colloquial name is the Hosoda faction because he is the, the titular head. Most of the, the, the factions are known by the, the head of the, the faction. So the Aso faction or the Takeshita faction or the Kishida faction, but they all have their own names too as a probably an attempt to take the personality out of it and create a legacy so that this faction will continue into the future. But originally the um, existence of factions was to elect the party president. And then after the party president was elected based on numbers of, of the factions and how they negotiate uh, where they're going to vote, then from there, uh, who gets the ministerial positions and the vice ministerial positions and that sort of thing. It's changed over time that the factions um, don't get that involved in, in policy, but in this particular election, it doesn't seem like they're aligned as they used to be in electing their, um, their leader as well. So that's one of the things that's curious about this particular election and it has implications for what we're going to be doing in the future when the prime minister is elected. So you can see here that um, the uh, Hosoda faction has Mr. Abe kind of in the background. Actually, Mr. Abe is is the more um, senior, not senior. He's the more um, powerful. He was uh, prime minister. Uh, Mr. Hosoda was never prime minister. Um, so he's he's kind of in the shadow there. He can't be the the head of the faction because other things are going on in the background, not just the uh, investigation by the public prosecutors, but. Um, uh, that is the largest faction. It has not determined any single candidate that it's going to stand behind because Mr. Abe has decided he's got another candidate that he would like uh, to endorse, uh, Takeishi Sanai. Um, but he's also opened the door for the younger members to vote with their heart as long as he, they vote the candidate that he, he might prefer if they're not going to uh, vote for Takeishi. You've got the Aso faction. Aso faction is um, the second largest, he's the vice, um, he's the deputy prime minister, he's the minister of, of finance, very powerful. Uh, Takeshi, uh, Takeshida faction is um, longstanding, uh, former prime minister's uh, brother uh, was running it. He unfortunately died just a couple of days ago. So that's causing a little bit of concern um, in how the votes will be cast. Uh, Nikai is the secretary general, and one of the reasons why you had this, this fight between Suga and Abe and Aso on one side and um, Mr. Nikai on the other side and Mr. Uh, Suga wondering, you know, how is he going to uh, control this as these guys are fighting with each other? And you've got, um, you know, Mr. Kishida with his own faction and Mr. Ishiba, who uh, was going to be a candidate and it looks like he, he bowed out and now he's endorsing uh, Mr. Kono. Um, I think that's good for that particular slide. Let's talk about who the candidates are and what the distinction is between them. I've created a, a just a profile just to kind of give you a sense of that. Uh, not always does their stance on policy determine their electability, but it is interesting to plot them out and to see what the differences are. So Konotara, as you know, has he's had several ministerial positions. Um, he is. Uh, you know, in charge of vaccine efforts. He's on TV quite a bit. He's a minister of administrative reform and regulatory reform. Um, so he's he's in the public eye quite a bit, economically advocates uh, in favor of market-oriented policies and further de deregulation. He's somewhat known 
I don't know if it's accurate as a maverick, as as somewhat of a wild card. Uh, maybe I guess that remains to be seen. Uh, with regard to constitutional reform and defense, since he was Minister of Defense, you can kind of guess he favors increasing defense spending. He's calling for more attention to put defense technologies and its outflow on the front burner. So he's friendly with the United States. He supports the United States bases and their, their stance with regard to China. So that's not much of a change. And um, you might remember um, earlier in his career, he was against uh, nuclear energy. He's changed his tune. And you'll see that quite a bit with some of the other candidates that have changed their tune or some of the song that one of the candidates is singing, they're now singing, for example, you know, women in, in the parliament, the percentage of women in the parliament or, you know, um, remain, retaining uh, surnames after marriage. He's, um, you know, he's in the ASO faction. He's, he's got eight terms. He's a, a seasoned uh, politician. The one thing he has going in his favor that the other candidates don't is that his father was Speaker of the House. So he's got that, that mentorship and that enormous um, uh, storehouse of favors and experience in the background. None of the other candidates have that. So I think he's, um, he's standing very pretty. Can I have the next slide, please? Next in line is um, Mr. Kishida. Um, you know, he's, he's one term more than Mr. Kono. Um, he, he's had uh, ministerial portfolios. He's seasoned, he's had LDP uh, positions. So his reach and his, um, his knowledge of the LDP and LDP members is far greater than Mr. Kono's. So um, on a kind of polling of, of likability within the LDP, he scores higher than Mr. Kono because of that. Uh, with regard to economic policy, he advocates reform and, and more towards the, the welfare state. And he wants the current, he, he believes the current structure just leaves too many uh, gaps and too many people left out. So he would like to um, see a doubling of income and, uh, you know, more, more emphasis on, on state intervention. With constitutional reform and defense, he supports new legislation, which was, would facilitate and enhance coordination between the Japan Coast Guard and the Maritime Defense Forces, and he favors increasing defense spending. Foreign policy, he's relatively moderate towards China, and he's trying to balance Japan and China, China, Japan. Um, he's kind of um, being very delicate about, about that. He does criticize China for the human rights violations, but he's more of a, a, of a centrist in, in that regard. Um, and um, I, I think he, he's in favor of you know, defending Taiwan. He's not vocally outspoken about it, but that seems to be his, uh, his main position. His, um, his greatest weakness is in, in um, campaigns. Most of his candidates, even in Hiroshima or the, those candidates who he has endorsed uh, when they're uh, running, have not, have not um, always done very well. Uh, so there's a little bit of, of reservation among those who are standing on the fence, the younger members. Um, but for the old guard, he is reliable. He's predictable, um, and when you watch him on TV, he's 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 very careful about what he says. But he's he wants to be prime minister, so he's he's trying to maintain that 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 level there. We have the next slide, please. Um, third on on the line, and probably in order of, of priority too. It's not just me that's ranking them in this presentation, but they're doing it on TV and in the newspapers. You'll see. Kono first or Kishida first, then either Kono or Kishida, and then you see uh, third, which is uh, Takichi Sanai, who is really a remarkable politician. Um, uh, she's had, you know, three uh, ministerial portfolios. Uh, she's not not a slacker. Um, she, in her younger career, it's it's interesting that, um, somewhat like me, I came from the United States and I worked in Japanese politics. She did the same thing. She went to the United States. And she was a congressional aide uh, to a member from Colorado, uh, Patricia Schroeder, which is really interesting for a Japanese to go do that after they've finished college. Um, I, I take my hat off to her. She speaks English uh, fluently, as you would expect. Um, in economy, she's, she's favor, in favor of more bold fiscal stimulus. So she's somewhat on, on the other side of the other candidates on that. She, 
wants to follow the uh, Abenomics. She has her own version of that. It's a little bit um, tighter than what Abenomics was. She actually calls it Sinaianomics. And she wants to raise the stocks related uh, taxes. Um, for defense, she is you know, even more right than what Mr. Abe was. She definitely wants to push the defense spending beyond the 1% uh, voluntary cap. And she, and she um, advocates a cybersecurity. So one of the things that uh, she promoted was, you know, let's create a, a cybersecurity agency. Since, since Mr. Suga created the digital agency, I want to create an agency too. He got a lot of uh, fanfare out of that. So maybe that is part of her, her, uh, her strategy. Foreign policy, um, as maybe if, if you look at her, her background a little bit, she's a little bit hawkish on defense and diplomacy. She wants to strengthen the security alliance with the United States. So with regard to foreign policy, she's standing somewhat close to, um, uh, to Mr. Kono, and she wants more robust measures to de deal with the, uh, the China problem. Uh, she's also been um, elected eight times, so uh, she's a very strong candidate. The thing she's got in her favor is Mr. Abe. Mr. Abe likes her a lot. I think the, the reason for Mr. Abe supporting her so much is to divide this uh, Kishida Kono fight. If, if, if it's a Kishida Kono fight, probably in the first round, Mr. Kono would win. Um, but if it's split up and the LDP members and the older fellows get their say, uh, probably it would be Kishida and maybe with the Kishida administration, Mr. Abe and some of these other it, uh, powerful individuals have more say. So there's there's that dynamic going on. And finally, next slide, please. We have uh, Noda Seiko, who has run for prime minister in the past. She's always wanted uh, to, to be a prime minister. She's really um, uh, committed to, uh, you know, women's rights and, and elderly reform and, and the social, social net that uh, Japan is somewhat famous for. Um, she was kind of number two to Mr. Nikai. So as a result of that, she's going to have her friends and she's going to have her enemies because Mr. Nikai was uh, so prominent and so powerful in running his organization. She was number two. And like in a lot of organizations, Mr. Nikai is, is older. He's, he's not as, as vibrant. So a lot of the work that was done that he promoted that he was on TV for, she was actually in the background. Um, she's in favor of womenomics and uh, very concerned about the declining birth rate and aging population, and she's generally against the deregulation of the economy. On constitutional reform, she opposes the expanding of the SDF, and she's calling for more focused on human human talent development and other cybersecurity defense issues. So she's somewhat uh, similar to Takeichi in that regard. She advocates a friendly relationship between China and Japan. In fact, she is you know one of the the key people on the Japan-China friendship. She's, she's one of the leaders of the, the group in the LDP that is, um, is driving that issue. And Mr. Nikai also was, was very um, uh, favorably inclined towards, uh, towards, uh, towards China. So that, that goes with it. Um, I think her, um, her strongest point is that she had Mr. Nikai as a mentor um, and the favors and the um, accumulated goodwill that he has been able to develop. She also, um, you know, benefits from that as well. Next slide, please. So when you take a look at the, the candidates and you line them up on economic policy and social policy, here's a graph that kind of defines them. And the, the background is the LDP. It's not Japanese society at large. So therefore we have Mr. Abe somewhat in the center because he, he just finished being prime minister a year ago. He was a longer serving prime minister. So a lot of the economic and social policies that we, we have now are a result of the Abe administration being there for three terms. So you can see that Mr. Kishida is, is more on the economic left than Mr. Kono. And you can see that uh, Ms. Noda is a little bit more friendly, a little bit more soft-hearted, a little bit more Komeito-like than uh, Sanai uh, Takeichi for um, uh, for for social issues. And so this graph kind of tells you where they where they stand on those policy issues and it helps you predict what kind of administration they might have should they become um, LDP president and therefore uh, president uh, prime minister. But let's talk about um, 
what that dynamic looks like. Um, next slide, please. You know, um, more likely than not, it's going to be a two-way race eventually. The first race is um, of the four candidates, um, you know, 382 members of the parliament get to vote. 382 votes are distributed throughout Japan. And um, as we said earlier, if if one of the candidates does supremely well, more than 50 percent, then they just become LDP president. But with a couple of spoilers in there, it's going to become a runoff. So Honotaro has a, a great advantage in that he's generally popular among the population. It doesn't mean that he's popular within the LDP. As I said earlier, Mr. Kishida has more skin in that game, far more skin than the other two female candidates. So it is more likely, not determined yet, but it's more likely that the runoff will be between those two top winners. Mr. Kono is um, predicted to be, you know, to, to get a, a good push from the 382 members, uh, numbers from the LDP at large. He'll probably do well with the younger LDP members, but they only comprise, you know, uh, 40%. It's the older guys, it's the guys that have been in the diet, you know, four or five or six times um, who, who have the lion's share. And so this distribution of who's voting for who is really critical. Just to describe the, the graph, you've got a lot of vectors that are pointing to Konotaro. Those are not determinative in the first round. In the first round, it's, it's popularity of the um, general public and balanced out with members of the parliament. So a lot of vectors are pointing to Konotaro, but it is unlikely that he'll get 51%. It's more likely that when they have the runoff election, this graph comes into play. And in this graph, you've got the two candidates, um, who is voting for them and who is who is against them. You've got Mr. Um, Ishiba over here on, on this side of the, the graph, who has, um, you know, he was going to be a candidate, but he's, um, he's disliked by uh, Taro Aso and Mr. Abe for a lot of historical reasons. Um, a little bit uh, due to his personality as well, but he is very strong among LDP members. So he has endorsed uh, Konotaro. He did that early. Um, he said, I, I'm not going to run, but I will endorse uh, Konotaro. Uh, that's a big boost for Konotaro. It will bring in um, a, a number of, uh, of LDP members for his vote, but that is definitely not determinative. It is not a huge number. Uh, Taro Aso and um, Mr. Abe uh, have far more weight in, in that regard. So um, it's, a, it's an interesting graph of who's going to be voting for who and who is telling people not to vote for different candidates. So typically um, the, the factions as we described earlier were set up to, to get to this point here. Who are you going to vote for as the party president? Because if I have the larger faction and my vote kind of sways the election, then I'm more likely to get more um, ministerial portfolios for the members in my faction and other people see that and if they're looking for a faction to join they're more likely to join my faction as a consequence my faction grows and as um, just a final point the the um, political factions are not really for policy there is so there are uh, specialty lobbies created uh, within the diet that are somewhat unaffiliated to the factions so this this combination that we're in right now where the factions are somewhat split, the heads of the factions are actually saying, if you don't want to vote for the candidate that I'm endorsing, you are open to vote for whoever you want to, just make sure it's not this person because he's affiliated with Mr., for example, he's affiliated with Mr. Um, Ishiba, who we don't like, who has been against us, who, who we've had a long running um, feud with. So don't vote for him, vote for the, this candidate or this candidate. The interesting thing about it is that in the LDP vote, th this is a secret vote, so you never know. Although, you know, things being as they are in Japan, you know, you make a public pronouncement, um, you, you pretty much stick to your guns when you do that vote. That vote will be, you know, a week from today. Let's see our next slide, please. So this slide describes um, the, the runoff 
election that uh, I've just talked about now, you've got the four candidates for prime minister. They will go to um, uh, an LDP election, a party election, and then of the candidates that are selected, they'll go to uh, a vote for, um, uh, I'm sorry, the LDP president will be selected, and then that person will be presented to the diet as a uh, prime minister. That will happen uh, on uh, the fourth in two weeks time. Uh, next week will be the election. It will be on a uh, Thursday. The, the prime minister will be announced. I'm sorry, the, the LDP president will be announced. It'll be Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then in the diet, they will open the diet and um, uh, the diet will elect um, their prime minister. The reason why the LDP, if you're the president of the LDP, you're almost guaranteed to become a prime minister is because it's a vote of both houses. It's a prime minister, it's not a president, it's not a dictator, it's a prime minister. So the majority of the vote of the members determines who's, who the prime minister is. The lower house has far many numbers than the upper house. They both hold their vote and um, the 51% winner takes takes uh the um i'm sorry the um prime minister will become uh the person with the most votes every political party will run as a candidate for prime minister their president and typically the members of the whatever political party it is the, the communists or the comato or the constitutional democratic party will vote for their leader since the ldp has the the, the most number of um, members, they will almost all vote according to uh, party lines. And so the LDP um, candidate will become the, the prime minister. Um, this is a, a, an open vote, so party people can see, you know, how their, their members are voting. But, you know, it's, it's unlikely that people would break rank and, and vote for somebody else. And in any event, the LDP is going to take that. Um, the formation of the cabinet after that, so uh, the new prime minister comes into office. He's elected uh, prime minister. The former um, cabinet dissolves. He has to come up with a new cabinet. He'll probably announce that um, the next day. Um, he's got plenty of time after the LDP election to know that he is going to become prime minister. So over the weekend, he will um, determine who his, um, who his cabinet will be. And then they'll have that announcement probably the next day. Um, the other uh, subsidiary uh, vice ministers and other party posts will be determined in, in due course, but it's really the, um, the cabinet that makes the biggest difference. So uh, next slide, please. We can take a look at what happened when Mr. Suga became um, LDP president and uh, um, prime minister with this kind of uh, step transaction that he had of, you know, announcing the resignation of Mr. Abe and then uh, the LDP, LG, L, LDP uh, uh, leadership was announced, and then the election, and then the nomination, and then his selection of the cabinet. I think it'll be a little bit um, more organized this time um, because we've had this this race. And throughout this race, it's kind of interesting to to note that uh, the LDP has really um, really burnished its image because. While the LDP is having this internal fight and their candidates are talking about what their policies are going to be, the opposition doesn't have that opportunity. They're not talking about why they're better or the better option than the LDP. People are watching the news and, and they're seeing these, these debates within these candidates. They're learning a lot about LDP politics and LDP policies uh, to the, the detriment of the, um, the opposition parties. So as, as you move towards election of the lower house, the LDP is just psychologically going to have um, even a, a, a better kind of stance to become, you know, the, the, the party in power. They already have 51% uh, of both houses and with their Comato coalition, um, they are approaching uh, the 66.2 thirds percent. They don't have it completely. Um, and that is, um, that gives them a full control of, of how, you know, diet policy, the, uh, appointment of different uh, posts and, and positions comes out, but um, 
it's, it's going to be very interesting. The next couple of days, you will hear a lot more. And you've also seen, um, uh, I'm, I'm getting towards the end of my presentation, but you'll also see um, as the candidates are on TV and as they study what the other uh, candidates have said, sometimes they change their tune a little bit. They take what's good, what the other party has said, and then they maybe uh, adopt it as their own position too. So you saw that uh, just the other day with um, uh, Noda saying, you know, there should be more women in Japanese politics. I think everybody uh, acknowledges that, um, you know, it, it, on a global standard, uh, Japan is very low in the participation of women in, in politics. So she said, you know, 30%, the next cabinet should be 30%, you know, women in politics should be uh, a much higher number than it is right now. And um, two of the other candidates, you know, endorsed that. One of them kind of held back on it. Similarly, one of the candidates said, you know, it's it's just unfair that women can't retain their name when they get married. And Konotaro thought that was a good idea. So he said the same thing. You'll see a lot of that. You'll see some uh, maybe dramatic statements to to distinguish the candidate from the other candidates. But it's a, it's a, a real interesting race. Um, although I talk a lot about uh, Konotaro and uh, Fumio uh, uh, Kishida, um, Sanai uh, Takeichi is also coming up really strong. If you follow what she's saying, the um, the pronouncements, she's looking like a really strong candidate. She's being coached. She's written a, a book. It's actually been ghostwritten for her to describe what her policy, what her public policy will be should she become prime minister. Konotaro did that maybe three weeks ago. He had his, his manifesto. It was a, a book about what he would be. Um, like as as Prime Minister uh, Kishida did that uh, far earlier. So there's a lot going on. Uh, it's something to to watch keenly. Um, I will be watching it and reporting, uh, you know, pretty frequently as this this evol uh, evolves. I'm really uh, much appreciative of everybody signing on this morning and um, being interested in this sort of thing. So I'd like to close it up and see if there are any uh, questions and questions that we can uh, ad address. Kelly. Great, thank you, Timothy. So I just want to uh, let our audience know um, you can engage with each other on the chat by directing it to everyone. And please submit your questions through the Q&A and or chat functions, and we'll begin to moderate those. So as those come in, Timothy, would you mind maybe uh, while we're waiting and, and uh, moderating the questions, perhaps you can elaborate again on this slide a little bit on the, the ASO dynamic with uh, Kono Taro and Kishida Fumio, as well as the, the interplay of the young lawmakers, perhaps? Sure, thank you. That's a, uh, maybe I, I glossed over it a little bit too much. Taro Aso, so uh, Mr. Um, Kono belongs to the ASO faction. Uh, traditionally and typically, the head of the faction is going to endorse that candidate uh, to be prime minister if he runs for it. Um, there's, there's a complex relationship going on here. Um, I think um, it's been reported that when Konotaro went to the boss and said, you know, I, I'm really thinking I'm gonna run this time. I ran last time, you told me to hold up my horses and I did, but I think this is my time now, I wanna run. Apparently, um, Mr. Aso said, listen, kid, it's not quite your time. I think this next administration is gonna be very brief. So maybe you don't wanna do that, but you know, um, if you're going to do it, go ahead and do it, but you don't get my full blessing. And that was rather shocking. I think um, people took great note of that. On the other hand, um, of the candidates, uh, uh, Kono is, is one of the youngest. Um, he's, he appeals to the younger uh, members. They are worried about what's going to happen to them. What they want more than anything else, what every diet member wants more than anything else is to be reelected. That is the sine qua non. You have to be reelected in order to do things. So um, the the younger members are more slanting towards uh, Konotaro. And I can tell you, although he's he's um, mostly criticized as being a reformist or a rebel, um, should he become um, a prime minister, I think you would see a, a really uh, a tremendous shift in how Japanese politics is is run. I think people who want it more standard, more staid, uh, will vote for uh, Mr. Kishida. And I think that's why um, Mr. Aso and also um, Mr. Abe are somewhat torn. Uh, Mr. Abe is less torn um, because he's not voting for uh, Kono. Although 
he and um, uh, Mr. Asso have been long-term colleagues and friends and, um, you know, in, in the diet together, um, th there's, there's mixed allegiances. So uh, it's an interesting mix um, with Asso Taro and um, Mr. Abe endorsing Mr. Kishida. I think that carries a lot of weight in the second round rather than in the first round. I hope that addresses it. Great, thank you, Timothy. So our next question is actually on the runoff elections, but you kept mentioning here 382 when it says 383. So perhaps you can explain that based off the recent um, death of uh, Mr. Takeshita. Right. So when we created this this graph, um, the, uh, the the calculus was 383. Unfortunately, um, uh, within the last week, the leader of the Takeshita faction um, uh, unfortunately passed away. So that diet seat has uh, not been filled. It will not be filled until there's a by-election for, for replacing that seat. So the number of diet members available to take that vote has been reduced by one. And to make it fair and even, the number of votes cast throughout the LDP throughout the nation has also been reduced by one. Great, thank you. So our first question is, why does the runoff round feature less prefectural votes? Oh, okay. So yes, in, in the runoff round, the LDP still retains 382 votes, whereas the rank and file, it's um, actually coalesced, it's divided into 47 uh, prefectural votes, and the rank and file members of the LDP vote for example, in a prefecture, 51% of those voting, that vote, that prefectural vote goes to that candidate. So what it tells you is that in the second round, members of the parliament have enormous, 90% um, of the, the weight of the decision will be reliant on members of the parliament who belong to the LDP. So yes, it's, it's, I, I guess the, the best explanation is since it's a parliamentary democracy and since the prime minister represents his constituency in the diet, it is um, reasonable for the um, members of the diet to hold more sway. And in fact, in other democracies, it, it frequently is determined that in, in the, the runoff, um, that's really the, the person who uh, becomes the prime minister, obviously, but uh, frequently, the person who wins the first round or the majority, not the majority, a plurality of the first round, the one of the more popular, doesn't end up being uh, the prime minister in the second round. And I think maybe that's the scenario we're looking at. Although it is predicted that Konotaro will do extremely well in the first round, in the second round, since the members of the diet hold, you know, 90% of the sway, the popularity of a candidate is holding less sway and what the diet members personally feel about that candidate is carrying far more weight. I hope that explains it. Great, thank you. Our next question is, what are the possibilities of the LDP losing the majority in the lower house election later this year? Um, you know, that's a, that's a great question. Um, that question came up quite a bit when Mr. Suga was considering um, replacing himself and uh, becoming LDP, LDP president once again, and therefore prime minister. It just wasn't looking like it was going to shake out. His popularity was declining. And in fact, the people that were against him, not just that they, they didn't support him, but they disliked him, was actually uh, rising. Younger members of the parliament saw that and thought, this is not a good idea. Um, many of the members are members of the parliament because of Mr. Abe. While Mr. Abe was in office, they had their um, their positions, and now Mr. Abe is gone. They don't have somebody that they can rely on, somebody that's going to pat them on the back, that's going to show up uh, on the campaign truck and endorse them. They are really nervous, particularly under a, a Suga administration. So under that scenario, it did look like the LDP would lose big, but probably not uh, below the, the 50%, especially with the Cometa coalition. Uh, currently, the LDP is the appreciation rate for uh, the LDP and what the policies are, are um, projecting now 
is increasing. It's about 43, 44% today. So it is likely that the LDP will not maintain par uh, the, the, the same position that they have right now. They'll probably lose a couple of seats, but they'll still retain, um, you know, 50% and uh, with the Comato, you know, a, a, a strong um, majority in both houses. Great. And uh, how does the Comato fit into the dynamics of this election? Okay, so Comato is um, um, uh, a coalition partner with the LDP. It is the softer side. Um, the LDP is typically characterized as big business. Comato is um, generally characterized as the social network, you know, taking care of, um, you know, uh, the, the older people, the social security net, you know, education, mothers, unwed mothers. Um, and the coalition was formed in order to keep um, the LDP in a, a prominent position. There was some trade-offs made, and um, the, the most valuable thing of this this uh, coalition is that the LDP can decide on certain areas within um, the elect electoral districts that uh, we're going to um, vote for your candidate, even though we're the LDP and you're Comato, we'll vote for your candidate so that you maintain the same number of uh, diet seats as you had before going into the election. And conversely, on in those areas where uh, you're not going to win anyway, you just vote um, for our candidate. And it's a it's a kind of symbiotic relationship. The great thing about uh, Comato, in, in addition to their their policies, their softer policies, their more social um, leaning policies, is that um, their their constituents are very tight. They they vote um, as their they're told they they listen to uh, what the leaders ask them to do uh, during elections. They show up for elections. They campaign for candidates. That sort of thing. It's it's a much stronger, much tighter group uh, than the LDP. Although the LDP is is a larger group, it's it's somewhat fragmented, as you can tell by the many uh, factions uh, within that party. Um, it's an interesting dynamic, and it's likely to continue. Great. What are the views of Japanese business slash K Danan? Who would they prefer? And how are they working behind the scenes to influence the election? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so Mr. Abe still retains a lot of power. Typically in Japanese politics, when you're the prime minister, yes, you have power. You report to or a cabinet and you have all of the members of the diet that you need to keep on good terms with. Your power actually increases once you're out of the limelight. You can you can be much more um, expansive. You can be much more just you know descriptive of what your policies and what your stances are without suffering the bullets since you're you've been in power. So the, the behind the scene guys um, weld a considerable amount of power for a long time. They're able to have factions that last you know even beyond their death. So. Um, Mr. Abe is um, very tied to K. Don Ren and to big business. He's working the phones so that his candidate, um, Sanai Takeichi, will become prime minister. It's unlikely due to the numbers that um, that that will happen, but it's it's a shot that that still is there. Um, so big business, uh, K. Don Ren is. Um, you know, listening to what Mr. Abe is saying, and they're also listening to Mr. Uh, Aso, who is the currently the Minister of Finance and Deputy Prime Minister, but particularly Minister of Finance, which wields a, enormous power on how money is spent and and how the economy is developed, and just a tremendous amount of the yen value, all sorts of things. So, what Mr. Aso might say is probably a little bit more. Uh, pertinent than what Mr. Abe might say, because he's actually got his finger on the buttons now. So people want to, uh, you know, do what he says. They want to uh, ingratiate themselves with him, and hopefully his candidate will win. So that relationship continues. So if I had to make a um, a, a call on that particular issue, I think biz big business would um, more likely vote with uh, uh, Kishida than with. Uh, Kono. Great, thank you. So our next question is Kono Taro is a member of the Aso faction, but Ishiba, who is in a bad relationship with Aso, 
has agreed to support Konotaro. Why did Ishiba agree to do this? Does this reiterate the fact that faction allegation allegiances are not very important in this election? Yes, yes, it does indicate that. And this is the first time that this kind of um, break has occurred. You'll remember that um, this, one of the reasons why this, this breakup started to occur was because Mr. Nikai had an a iron grip on the, the LDP on elections, who was going to run for elections, uh, how much money they would get for their campaigns. That was his job as Secretary General. And this caused a great um, disconsent, discontent with Mr. Abe and Mr. Aso. They wanted him to do uh, other things, and he was holding to to his, you know, his line. They had candidates in in election districts that were competing with a Nikai endorsed candidate and Mr. Abe's endorsed candidate, and of course, Mr. Nikai would be supporting that because. His faction, although it's probably number four, it is number four, he wants to increase the number there so that his faction becomes larger, even though he might not be secretary general. They wanted him the hell out. And so that was part of the negotiation with Mr. Suga. You remember that Mr. Suga was visiting Nikai several times and uh, on the kind of the final day when um, actually the next day, Mr. Uh, Suga announced that he was not going to run. He had a very prominent meeting with Mr. Nikai, it only lasted 10 minutes, but the word was that Mr. Nikai agreed uh, with Mr. Suga that he would he would turn over um, the, the seat of Secretary General. And when Mr. Um, uh, Suga became Prime Minister again, he would no longer be uh, Secretary General. So um, at this time, uh, Mr. Ishiba also uh, came up as a candidate, potential candidate for Prime Minister. And I think the play here is he's given that up because he's gambling for Secretary General in a new administration under um, under Mr. Kono. That makes the, the most amount of sense to me that he would he would be doing this not to be get yet another ministerial portfolio. He wants to be in the LDP, a position of, of more tremendous power um, and something that solidifies you know his further relationship beyond what uh, a ministerial portfolio would do. I think that's the play there, and I think that's the the tension between Mr. Aso, Mr. Abe, and and Mr. Ishiba. Mr. Ishiba wants to become, a, you know, more prominent figure, and Mr. Kontar gave him that opportunity, even though he's not carrying a whole lot of of um, potentially diet member seats with him. He is carrying a lot of the the younger um, members. So uh, we'll wait and see how that dynamic uh, rolls out. I hope that responds. Great, thank you, Timothy. So we're coming to the top of the hour. So I'd like to perhaps uh, close a little bit early here and uh, pass the floor back over to you for closing remarks. Great, thank you very much, Kelly. And um, everybody in the audience, thank you for staying tuned. Um, this is something that we do as a, as a part of our business. So um, if you're in a position where you need uh, advice and counsel, you need to know what's going on in Japanese politics, you need to develop inroads into getting your product or services, you know, a, a fair shape in, in entering the stream of com commerce or that you just need to develop that relationship because your competition is, you're, you're fighting with them on, on the political scene as well. Uh, it's something that we do. Uh, if you have questions or concerns, please visit our webpage. We have policy reports. Um, distributed uh, pretty frequently that are insightful. But if you need, you know, more intense uh, insight and information, boots on the ground, that sort of thing, that's the, the kind of service that we provide as a public affairs consultancy. So um, log into uh, Langley Esquire and uh, download or, or re register for some of the updates that we have. Please stay tuned. We'll be talking, you know, publicly about what's going on in politics uh, on a regular basis. It's great to have you here in the audience. Thank you very much. I hope you learned something and, and enjoyed at least uh, part of the presentation. Thank you.